Hey, what's up, you sexy bitches, and welcome back to this week's Weekly D. And today I have the lovely Onyx Sachi on with me, and we talk about a range of different topics from the use of the word exotic all the way down to getting naked on stage and how you do it, because I'm not really sure that I could. I'd be way too shy. So what about you? Could you do it? I'm intrigued to know. Let me know. <laughs> Without further ado, this is the weekly D. Because, honey, if you're not getting your D on the daily, you better at least be getting it once on the weekly. If you're not getting any, if you want some tea, then come and join Dan up on the weekly D. Well, a very big welcome to the gorgeous Onyx. How are you doing? Good, a little exhausted. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Why are you exhausted? It's early for me. I'm a What's, princess getting yeah, up true. early. Come What's on. What's the time there? It's like uh, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. It's not I too love bad. That. You're like, you're like 10 a.m. It's so early. <laughs> <laughs> but then you go to bed quite late, right? Yes, yeah. What's a normal bedtime for you? Um, depending if I don't get like bought out for dances all night, I'll be there till about come home around 4 a.m., 3 a.m. Right. Yeah. So yeah. actually, like 10 a.m. is pretty early for that. Yeah. Well, I yeah. appreciate you waking up. For me. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. Before we get started and get like into the whole shindig, can you uh, give like everyone like a little bit of an intro, a little bit of a like who, what, where, when, a little bit about Onyx? Just tell us all about you. Yeah, I love talking about myself. <laughs> so you should. <laughs> um, well, as you know, my name's Onyx. Um, I've been dancing for 18 years. So I'm what you call a veteran in this industry. <laughs> um, definitely danced all over the world. Uh, I started dancing through Amateur Night. That's how I got hooked with that fast cash. It was easy money. Um, I've got a whole bunch of accolades, over 30 major titles, international titles, uh, Play Playboy published, uh, Vice articles, iHeartRadio, I have a book coming out, the list goes on, but you know, lots of time for that later. <laughs> yeah, you like, but enough about me. <laughs> so Playboy, tell me about that. What was that like? Um, it was awesome. Um, we got to go to a mansion in Las Vegas, not the Playboy Mansion, but a nice mansion that we did our shoot in. There was about six of us doing it all together. So it's not like, I guess most people would think like a stereotype, like, oh, like were there naked girls all over the place and pillow fights and all that? No, it was a professional photo shoot. Everyone was like there for business. <laughs> so we had like our makeup artist on site, um, our photographer that we all use and we all had different spots in the house and different magazines and in the South Africa. Right. Playboy. Yes. <laughs> I think and, it's um, funny though how people, like you said, it's a professional shoot. I think, you know, it's not just people that are around like, oh look, tits. It's like people these people have seen boobs a thousand fucking times. Do you know what I mean? They don't yeah, give a yeah, shit yeah. about naked body. They just so want to get these good shots. Of exactly. course. Exactly. I wonder, um, and actually completely separate subject, but being in the sex work industry, does it desensitize you personally in any way to sex and how you view it and stuff yeah definitely being in that environment and also too it, it's really hard not to sexualize people like i'm very bad for that i don't mean to be i almost don't even notice that i'm doing it but i think it's because of the industry that i am i'm constantly doing that but um i just totally forgot what your question was because i, well, went I was on just a tangent. saying like de <laughs> desensitizing yourself to like mm -hmm like your own sexual experiences like does it yes. you know does it make you did it like what would you say your relationship was with sex before you became a sex worker oh non-existent i was definitely i think it's different for everybody i was uh raised in a cultural aspect so it's very strict household super religious mm -hmm. um shunned from the family when i became a stripper so i didn't have sex until i was 18 I didn't okay. start drinking until I was 19. So it was a, I was a late bloomer for all that. Very green. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. That's, yeah. that's fair enough though. Like, I mean, obviously it's your choice when you want to do that, but, and mm -hmm. you think that was more because of your upbringing and, and you've said they, they just like shunned you since you became a sex worker. You don't talk to them at all. Oh, I talk to them now. I feel like now that I've accomplished my, established myself, which I, which shouldn't have to be the case, but my mom has definitely come around. We like, we talk to each other. We, do family events and all that. Nice, so nice. she's, yeah, she's 
1944. So she lives in like really strict old ways, old habits. Right. So uh -huh. I can't really blame her for that. It's kind of hard to change. Well, of course, like it's hard to change, especially to something that is definitely very progressive, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I find that kind of cool that you have that view because normally people who are quite progressive, they sometimes are a bit like, oh, I don't care what year you were born. You need to understand this. And, you know, whether you're, you know, people start with homophobia. Like, I don't expect mm -hmm. old people to, to like gay people. Of course they don't. They mm -hmm. were taught that homophobia was normal, like in there. Yeah. So it's just one of those things. It's a really funny story, actually, because my stepmom is Jamaican. And when my dad first got with my stepmom, my nan, his mom, like completely disowned him. She was just like, what are you doing? Like, and now, like, obviously she's part of the family and of course she came around, but you know, for her, racism was such a normal thing back when she was younger, there wasn't that many, you know, black people that she knew. And yeah. then, you know, you have to learn, don't you? You can't just, you, you got to come around to the idea, I guess, and understand yeah. it and learn about it. So, you know, it's really good to hear. So especially someone like you, who is, you know, quite, I don't know, like, like an activist when it comes to these sorts of issues that you mm -hmm. can understand that actually generational differences can have very much an influence on things like this, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, would you say like um, your, career, your career path that you followed, is it something that, if we, would you do it the same way that you've done it again? Like, are you happy with the way can you tell us a little bit more about that side of things because I, I, I mean <laughs> I'm talking because I already know the sort of stuff that you do but tell us about it like you started in the strip club where did it go from there because you're like a international freaking burlesque champion right yeah I'm, I, I'm all the things I'm the enigma <laughs> exactly you're unfucking stoppable babes I but love like, it I love <laughs> it <laughs> like what was first stripping was first what came next um so yeah amateur night and then stripping and then I wish I would have changed, actually. I love the outcome of where I'm at now, but I definitely would change how I started. Amateur night, for sure. I think I would have continued to do amateur night the entire time because they were giving $1,000 for the winner. So I should have just stuck dancing doing that. But there was still a lot of money in making stripping. So I did become the stripper after amateur night. And the money was so, so good. And I just wished I traveled more. I stuck at the one club because, one, I was scared and naive. And my first time stripping, new, no one really teaches you anything. No one really, I, don't, I didn't find a sisterhood either until I kind of was stripping for longer periods of time and people accepted me into their group or whatnot. But um, I found um, the industry more cutthroat and um not forgiving and you need a really thick skin to do some certain things so yeah i wish i traveled more got to experience um uh, more venues i wish i wasn't so boy crazy back then <laughs> i wasted so much money and time on men um yeah, I wish I was more focused and driven to make more money and but then there was it took me about when did I start Miss New Canada? 2006. So I started when I started doing the big competitions. That's when I realized I was like, oh, I can I can do like Cirque shows and and um, big costume showgirl stuff. And I was really more interested in that. And that's when my focus changed to, oh, business side of things. And let's continue to do these competitions. And as I searched for more competitions, those took me places and outside of my comfort zone and into other clubs. And then I was like, OK, I get it now. But it was uh -huh. always like having to get over that fear and to just go right yeah and these competitions that you're talking about they're not all just burlesque are they are any of them like strip strip club yeah Sorry, they're all me, strip clubs they're strip most club of competitions them. yeah most of them are strip club competitions and so yeah. the first one was uh queen of the strip in toronto and miss new canada is a stripping competition that's been going on for decades decades and it's passed down from producers to different producers I'm and, not sure what's happening with it now, but it's, and that competition it's been, is on pole, so it's like on pole type stripping, or can it be away from the pole type stripping? Like, I feel like it's based on how you can entertain and engage with the crowd. Because I feel like a winner doesn't need to know pole tricks in order to win. Because we've had a Miss New Canada that didn't do any pole tricks, and I watched her show, and I was enthralled by it. It was amazing. <laughs> 
Right. It was amazing. So what makes <laughs> the difference then? Again, sorry, you've got to forgive me for my ignorance on this. Yeah. I don't know much about burlesque industry. What makes the difference between that person doing this strip routine without a pole and a burlesque performance? Um, a burlesque performance is like telling a story. You're still, you're still the art of taking clothes off in a nice, uh, sneaky way, I guess you would say. So like more like teasing, one of those, like more yeah, teasing, teasing. It almost looks like a magic trick. You know what I mean? And then, um, with stripping, I mean, for features strippers, it's the, it's kind of like the same thing only mm. with, um, uh, more high energy and, and poles, right? And right. then also you're showing off the badge to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I see some of the clips, but well, obviously I see the parts that you're able to post on social media. Yeah. Uh, I don't see the end of the routines, but I see the, the some of these costumes and these props, oh my God, like, it's a, it's a full on show, isn't it? Like It's quite the investment, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. I mean, so how how many competitions like this have you actually won? Oh, goodness. I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't know, but the major ones that I like to talk about, so like the, the last five, I guess. So Miss Nude Universe, um, Miss Nude Duo World, Miss Nude Canada, uh, Miss Nude Showgirls. What else do I got in there? A whole bunch of other stuff, you know? But those, are the, those are the top important ones, you know? And <laughs> I always... I always wonder, like, before you started stripping, how, how would you have felt if someone had said, like, we want you to perform for us and just totally strip naked? Like, did, how did you feel about nakedness before stripping? And, like, what was your first day like at, at the strip? I always just think, like, it must be really hard to just be thrown into a club and be like, go on then, go take all your yeah. clothes off. There's no warm-up. There's no, like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it must be yeah. really intense. Like, tell me more about that. So I feel like I turned to alcohol a lot when I started stripping, which is not most cases for most people, but I have a bit of social anxiety. So I started drinking and that's how I conquered my fear. But I'm not suggesting to do that because now I don't drink alcohol at all. I've been sober for six months now, Amazing. but I definitely use that as a crutch. I don't suggest it, but that was my crutch to get on stage because I was terrified. I had no idea what I was doing. And then once I started getting comfortable, but I feel like it was kind of a bit too late because I was already drinking, I was partying. Uh, it was kind of part of my brand that I was the stripper party girl on stage all the time. But no one really wants to be that person. And honestly, like I said, it was a crutch for me and I'm kind of glad I'm out of that kind of lifestyle. Right. So you don't strip at all anymore? Uh, I do strip. I just, I'm so busy with a whole bunch of other things right now. So when I have time, I'll go to Ontario to strip because Alberta is not my cup of tea and they don't like me either. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You mean the yeah. clubs don't like you or you mean the clientele? So the clubs, I'm actually um, what you call the whistleblower for the Alberta kind of BC clubs um, right now. And since then, there's been an agency that monopolizes all the clubs. So if you work for Alberta clubs, you have to go through that agency, which means you lose your rights as a contractor and you become an employee through them. So it's like a subcontractor. So that means you lose all your rights because one, they make you sign contracts through them and then the clubs also make you sign contracts waving all your rights away. But in order to work, you have to sign those contracts. Right. So it's like... <laughs> but, but you don't have to do that in Alberta. No, you do have to do that in Alberta. So, oh, so but I don't, but I'm not, but I choose not to because of when I called them out and they don't want to book me anywhere because of that. Oh, and, sorry. Where was the place you said that you do go to strip now? That's not. Yeah. So I, I'll travel to Ontario and I'll work Ontario. at Rock Sands and it, Fanny's in North Bay. Yeah. Okay. Or and, Ottawa, and they don't, Newton. They don't have no. this. Oh, that's just You crazy. just go, you advertise yourself and you go to work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. And is that specifically to the Canadian like um, strip scene, or is the US scene like that as well? The US scene also has agencies, but you don't always have to go through them, and they don't they don't stronghold you 
Right. If you do go against them, right? Mm-hmm. So there is still that freedom there, but at the same time, uh, the agencies provide. Um, they just make it easier for you. They're supposed to make it easier for you. They're supposed to have that person that you can go to to be like, "Hey, this happened at this club. Can you do something about it?" You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. the agencies in the U.S. They'll actually do something like that. Whereas the agencies in in Canada, which is just the one independent artist, like we'll call them out. Um, they don't have your back or interest in mind. So, and they're always going to tax you any way they can. Right, so. exactly. Well, but I think it's good that you're calling behavior like that out. Why? why uh, so are you saying that it's just them that are kind of anti you? It's like the dancers, I assume, all appreciate you calling it out, right? Because I guess a lot of them are probably too scared to do it. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? It's not like I'll hear them voice their opinion because they can't. Right. <laughs> because as soon as they do, they're going to lose their job too. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. So you're in a position where you can kind of afford to be a voice for the people. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's up, everyone? Sorry to interrupt your podcast. I just wanted to come on and tell you really quickly about one of our sponsors for this podcast, which is Superfly Honey. So tell me, do you want to be Superfly Honey? Well, honey, of course you do. <laughs> well, if you want to be Superfly, you need to make sure you get yourself some Superfly Honey grip leggings. Now, Superfly Honey specialise in these grip leggings that you may have seen all over Instagram at the moment. Everybody's wearing them. And these are great for anyone who like to just keep themselves a little bit more covered up. Maybe you're polling in a cold country and you need some extra grip because your skin just isn't giving you the grip you need. Well, Superfly Honey have got you covered with their grip leggings. Now, they told me to give an honest review, and I did have a pair sent to me, and I can tell you the only thing that was sad about them was that the pair they sent me didn't fit me. (laughs) They were too small, and they were too short because I needed their tall range. So if you're like me, and you're a tall bitch too, guess what? They've got their own tall range. They obviously just didn't realize that I was a six-foot glamazon, so they sent me their tall range and now I have one of their tall pairs of leggings and they fit so snug there's no movement on them I didn't feel like they were going to cause any friction they were super tight to the legs so they felt really comfortable and for any of you out there who like to stay covered up these are amazing for you and definitely an option to try out so go and check out Superfly Honey but yeah so tell me more about um your role as kind of like an activist within the stripper community then? Is there any other stuff that you've had to do in order to fight for, like, you know, stripper, burlesque dancers, rights and stuff that you, you've you had to do and it's, it's caused you problems before? Um, Just, like, any time I voice an opinion, everyone always has to shut me down, which is totally fine. I think everyone should have their own voice and, like, their own thoughts on things. But I wish people would stop gaslighting me. Right. <laughs> and that's where I find the, the hurt in the industry is when, especially some other strippers or burlesque dancers will, will call me up for saying something that they didn't believe was right, but it's factual. But anyways, that's another story. Right. Um, um, I just want to make sure, like, because the only thing that I've done is, is this whistleblower thing, which has pushed me into wanting to do more for strippers. So anytime I can uh, or have the platform to do so or space, I'll hire them for gigs. I'll hire them for um, judging at my competition. Um, I have an entertainment agency now that I'm in the process of trying to um, work on getting work visas for or performer visas for people that want to go to the U.S. to work because right now Canada is shit and the U.S. dollar is amazing. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm here to I'm here to find all that information that strippers aren't getting because no one's really helping anybody out. So right. you're doing you're, you're fighting the good fight. It's it's one of those yeah. things though. Do you not find though when you're trying to do something good, there's always going to be someone who's against it, you know? But I think it's because yeah, it's just it's <laughs> change, isn't it? They don't like change and they don't. It's mm-hmm. scary. Did you ever think about running your own agency? Like you know these agencies that employ the strippers for the clubs and stuff. Have you ever gone to the clubs and said, right, we've started our own agency, we've got all these dancers, you actually are going to have a better deal with us because of blah, 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 whatever, whatever. And then just basically taking over their business. Yeah. 
I mean, I would love to, and I've always thought of that, but I feel like, um, like I said, they've got quite the stronghold here and, um, <laughs> it's scary in recent events, right? They, uh, they bully you and corrode you into fear. And no, I don't think it would be a good idea for, I mean, it is a good idea, but it's kind of dangerous. Cause wow. I feel like in some sort of way it might be burned down. God, you forget <laughs> yeah. how like dangerous the industry can actually be sometimes. So that's some mm -hmm. of the people that work in it. Um, mm -hmm. So tell me about your, sorry, totally transitioning because you mentioned it a second ago, your competition. Tell us about your mm. competition. It's called Strip Down, right? Yeah, yeah. So Script Down or Strip Down, but we decided to call it Strip Down just because of the way um, social media is erasing the whole That's why I said Strip Down. Strip. I assumed, yeah, I assumed yeah. you were going to call it Strip Down, but you couldn't. Yeah, yeah, Isn't yeah. I wanted so to, annoying? but I was like, you know what? <laughs> They're going to like block me from the algorithm if I do. So, <laughs> mm, <nuts. laughs> but it looks good. The logo looks good. It does. It looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was in I was in um, a studio. Well, what studio was it? I was in. I think I was in Toronto, and um, they had a post up. I was like, oh. I was like, I'm going to be nice. seeing her. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yay! But, so, Thanks, I, studio. Have you um, have you done one already? Uh, no, this is my first uh, festival competition. Actually, it's kind of funny that you said that because one of my judges, Nikki Ninders, my good friend, she's like, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, yeah. She's like, you know, it's such a good thing being a producer and all. Look at you. You go for the biggest thing ever, starting a festival. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> is it, who who else I, is helping you? Are you doing it all yourself? Um, most of it is all me, but I have um, Janelle from, I don't think you've met, have you met Janelle? Workshop at a Radio Fitness? I don't know if you met her. The name she rings a bell. I think, I'm sure she took a yeah, class in I believe she? she came in afterwards for the pizza meet and greet. Yeah. And she sat right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was, I recognize the name, so, so why do I recognize that name? Yeah, yeah. She, so she is definitely like one of my writers. Um, and then I've got someone in Ontario, her name's Carmen. And she's also a veteran stripper still working. And I have her doing like the, what do you call that? The stage management stuff. Cause she still does um, rigging for a living and circ performance for a living nice. and all that stuff. So she knows all that. And I'm like, good, because I'll do the front of the house. You do the back of the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's going to be crazy. <laughs> so it's not just going to be a competition. This, this, the script down is going to be a competition plus a festival. Would you say? Yeah, so it's going to be, it's a three-day event. So on the second, we have workshops. On the third, we have more workshops and a panel discussion with guest speakers. And the competition is also on that day. And then as, as well on that day, we have like seven or eight vendor tables that are going to be there. So Shoe Freaks, um, Redefined Fit is going to be there, Knox Productions, Straptio, uh, la, 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 Divi Divinity Poleware. Redefine Fit. A whole fit. bunch of brands, that, yeah. That's where I saw yeah. the sign, Redefine Fit. So is she involved in the competition as well then? Yeah, yeah. So she's one of our sponsor studios that's going to be lending us her studio to rent for all the workshops. And she also got a vending table. And yeah, she's I'm lovely. really impressed with how the community came together for this because honestly, I don't think it would have started the ball rolling quick enough without all the sponsors we got of course so. yeah well, i mean yeah. in the first year as well so so it's kind of I gonna know. be like a almost like a pole convention but for stripper style for canada and stripper style yeah that's awesome yeah and what i'm really excited what sort of teachers have you got coming to teach um so we've got jordan kensley tara meyer kiana walker young pole master nikki nine doors siggy cortez uh, Tia Jax. Oh my God. Yeah. I feel like I named them all. I'm not sure, yeah, but there's some, nine of us. There's nine judges. That's some big names. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. And have you yeah, sold? They came through. Have you sold all your tickets and stuff already or? Um, workshops are almost sold out and surprisingly tickets have been selling consistently since I, uh, opened the box office in June. That's amazing. And I've been shocked. I've been shocked. Yeah. When is it? Um, <laughs> so when is this competition? What date is it? Uh, November 3rd. Okay, so actually, August, uh, yeah, okay. Well, for anyone who's listening to this episode, because by the time this episode goes out, the show still won't have happened yet. So if you haven't got tickets yes. ready and you're in Canada or you can get to Canada <laughs> easily, make sure you go and see it. It's in Toronto, right? Yeah, yes. yeah, of course. So um, 
yeah that's so awesome so well, good luck with it and i hope that really goes well and stuff but I'm thank really, you so I'm much really sad i can't come and be at it but it sounds like it's going to be awesome like and it's yeah, something that you're really planning good. on doing like every year yeah it's to turn out already that i think it's going to happen again oh well, it is going to happen again next year for sure because awesome. i think we've got enough donations to start it again so uh -huh. So yeah. one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because it's um, something that you have posted about, uh, I know you comment a lot on the Tuesday topics. Thank you very much. It's always insightful to see your comments. <laughs> um, your thoughts on the word exotic. So oh, if, this word. Yeah, this, <laughs> this word, like I'm just, it's a really difficult one because, you know, that's why that topic came up the other day. It's because people are using it again. It's like, it's, mm. I, I don't know whether this is a great example, but you know, like, it's almost like no one's taking it seriously. Like no one would ever just walk into the street and say the N word, but people have gone back into the studios and are starting to say exotic again. And, you know, I don't know. Do you think that's because they don't see it as serious as like the things like the N word? That's exactly why. That's exactly why. And I know, I mean, no one's got, no one has to take my advice, but when you learn the history of where it comes from and, like the generational trauma that people experience today because of it. It's like labeling, taking the word exotic is like labeling yourself with that history. Mm. And it doesn't really belong to them. You know what I mean? Right. And that's where, that's where that anger comes from. Like why? But I mean, like if, if, if erotic makes you uncomfortable, I feel like people should ask themselves why you don't have to call it erotic heels. It could be something different, but I always, I'm always like, it's just one letter that's changed. Why does that make you feel so uncomfortable when it's not a bad thing? especially if you support strippers and sex workers, call it erotic because it is erotic movement. No. But is it? And, and the only reason I say that is because I tend to, I tend to notice that people who use the word erotic tend to be the people that dance more stripper style. And you know, because mm -hmm. you've obviously been to my workshops that my heels class that I teach, I don't, uh, would you say that was erotic in any way? Cause no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, but I would call it, um, well, I, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a style of dance. I, just, right? it's I not call erotic. it dance with Dan. I just thought yeah. if I call it dance with Dan, that pretty much all it is because you know just because yeah. we're wearing heels I wouldn't necessarily class myself as erotic in any way I wish I was but <laughs> I wouldn't say I class as erotic in any way whatsoever but you know um it's one of those things like what would you think about the people who say like well you know we call things like exotic fruit exotic birds like why can't we call this style exotic well, what's your answer to that because I never really know what to say to that um because I think, because the word exotic comes, like, let me think, let me think, let me think. Okay, so the first time I was called exotic, I was, I was a child, and it came off as confusing, because the first thing I thought of was, like, is this person comparing me to a zoo animal? Like, what does that mean? And that's just innocent thinking of that age time that I was at, mm. so that's where the exotic animals comes from, but calling people of color exotic comes from slavery and trading them into um, brothels or um, pla and places where they'd be treated like animals and disregarded as such. Um, so I think that's why people are confused as to, well, they call animals that, why can't we call human beings that? It's because we've always called animals that, and people of color were treated like animals and called exotics because they were compared to animals. Mm. And what do you, do you do anything like, cause there must be people that you follow who are still using the word, like, or there must be people that you see are still using it. Do you, do you say something every time? Cause that sounds exhausting. It is exhausting and no, I don't. Cause I'm still a fan of some people that use the word, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I love you though, but. But I just wish you'd but, learn more about you it know, yeah. you know of course yeah. i think it's so difficult isn't it because i'm the same i've got so many people that use the word and if i'm being really honest with you when i'm looking for inspiration i have to use the word when i type it into instagram because that's what everyone else is using like i use mm -hmm. like hashtag exo and stuff but you know no one uses that no one uses it i mean is it becoming more of a thing a little bit but everyone uses hashtag exotic pole. So when I need to buy that sort of stuff, I have to search the hashtag because it's everyone else using it. It's, mm -hmm. it's frustrating. I feel like morally, I'm like, do you know what though? Yeah, it's difficult. It's a bit annoying, but you're doing the right thing. So I feel like, 
morally I feel like yes it might be annoying but I'm doing the right thing do you know what I mean it just Mm -hmm. comes down to that whole thing of like why would you want to use a word that makes people feel uncomfortable (laughs) you know what I mean which is why Mm -hmm. and it's the same with things like pronouns and stuff to totally change subject here but you know the people who just can't accept pronouns I'm just like but why does it affect you so much that you can't just call that person them you know it doesn't mean you have to agree with it and you know you don't have to yeah. understand it even you just like, you're just being mm-hmm. respectful you know what i mean exactly like yeah. it's like i call people by their names because that's what they would like to be called and you could say well i i don't want to call them their name i want to call them a dickhead do you know what i mean it's like well i'm not going to do yes, that exactly. that's not respectful because exactly. they, they wish for you to call them the name that they identify with so it's funny isn't it like i just yeah and i know that's a really weird way to look at it but i've just i've just got this thing where i'm just like i'm just not going to use it because i don't i don't want to upset anybody i mean what's what's your views on that do you think that how do you feel about people that don't get it they're just like to be honest with you on it like, i just don't get it and, and like but i'm going to respect you and i'm going to not use the word but I still don't really understand why it's such a big problem. Like, do you get bothered by people who are like that? Because when it comes to things like anything, homophobia, you know, the word exotic, things like that, they're like, well, I don't use that word anymore, but I don't really understand why still. I'm always like, that's okay. I'm like, I don't want you to, you don't even need to understand if you don't want to, but so long as you're respectful Mm -hmm. of the fact that you shouldn't, that's all good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How do you feel about things like that? What's your view? Or do you think everyone should just Um... understand? Well, if they're friends of mine, <laughs> it's going to be a problem. Right. But anyone else, you know, like I said, I'm not going to force my views on anybody. But I feel like people that know me know that it is it, it is an issue and it's harmful to me. And I want them to respect that out of my respect. But also I want them to take the time to educate themselves as to why this hurts me. And for you to be like oh, well, I don't really get it, but I won't use it because you're my friend or because I respect you. You're not respecting me because it's like you're not even trying to mm. get it. You're not trying. And that's, re- that's how that comes off right. to me. Yeah, it's more just about mutual respect, isn't it, than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. But it's funny, do you not find like on the internet like a lot of people aren't really like that? It's like they just won't accept any other answer except for their own answer. And I kind of hate that. It's so much easier behind a computer, you know what I mean? Right. So easy behind a computer. Agreed. (laughs) Hey, what's up, everyone? So sorry to interrupt your episode. I just wanted to come on really quickly and tell you a little bit about Polos.com. Did you know that we offer international shipping? Well, we've always offered international shipping, but now we're offering it at a much more reasonable price because shipping from the UK is crazy expensive. So we had to do something about it. So now you can get all of our awesome designs shipped to your home at a much more reasonable price. So why don't you go and check out polols.com today? Because if you want a t-shirt that's got a picture of some pole dancing cats on, maybe some pole dancing dogs, maybe you want a t-shirt that says heels bigger than your dick on it, there's something for everyone. So go and check out polols.com today. Let's get back to the episode. Cool. Well, one of the things that came up, and I'm going to put out there now that I did ask this person to come onto the podcast. They didn't reply to me, and it's totally fine. Um, it is totally fine. Um, and I understand why they didn't reply. Uh, but I just thought before I discussed it with anybody, I would just put it, I'd put it out there for them to be able to come and discuss it with me if they wanted to before I discussed it with anyone else. But one thing that was discussed, and it was on the topic, which you've seen, so I know you've probably seen the comment, was that it was about a judge in the US um, judging exotic generation and Jordan Kensley and Nadia Sharif replied saying I think this is about look well Jordan said I think this is about Nadia and then Nadia was like Nadia commented and said why didn't you just tag me Um, and then someone replied to her and said well are you going to explain why you did it you know when you were such a big advocate for it And Nadia replied and said, well, are you trying to make a point or do you actually have a question? And she was like, well, I'm trying to make a point. And nothing else was said. So I I messaged Nadia. I was like, do you not think this would be a great topic to discuss? Let's let's talk about it. Like, and just so people can understand your side. And I think that's the really sad part is that she didn't want to talk about it. Or maybe she just didn't have a chance to reply. I don't know. But what's what's your views on that? Would you judge a competition that was called Exotic Generation, for example? 
The person that owns that brand has done a lot of weird things, messed up things. Right. So I, I would be a no on that. And the way, I mean, it's like whoever's running it now, I think some things have changed and whatnot. Good on them. But I feel like once the, like it's, it's been blossomed from like all the drama of that, mm. that I, I, I would clearly for me, I would stay away from. And then just the title itself is a no for me right. because it's just perpetuating the, the word again, like something that we're trying to get rid of. Like, I mean, it sounds so cool, but no. Uh-huh. <laughs> and what what's your thought because then someone had, again like so it's really funny actually i thought that topic was like super boring i thought no one was going to really reply to it i thought whatever you know people are just going to be like oh whatever like and it blew up and, and then literally a few like how many hours later i was like oh my god i was like what the hell and you know when you're going through all the comments you're like fucking hell like this is really sparked some debate i was like wow okay but you know do you what do you feel about because someone had comments saying oh well it's not called exhausted generation anymore it's called x gen or something like this yeah they like shortened it or they something. shortened it do you think that makes yeah. it more acceptable in your opinion obviously we don't speak for everyone of course just putting that out there. i mean it, it's they're 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 trying to say the same thing they're not saying x like boyfriend or x communication you know what i mean it, they're trying to say the same thing mm. So, so it kind of just stays the same in your books, you think? Mm-hmm. It does. It does. So what's your thoughts then on the whole situation of someone judging it who has said they don't support the word? What do you think? Like, what is... I mean, if why would you judge it if you don't support it? That That's my first question. You know, why would you put yourself in that situation? You should have turned... I would have ch- turned the judging judging request down because obviously it's not like you were forced to do it mm. so and then also coming in there with um a feeling of i don't like this well how is that gonna judge like your judging score is gonna be biased basically you know what i mean you're gonna like judge out of whatever you're feeling not based on the person's performance so well, especially obviously if everyone in the competition is like you said using the hashtag using the, the word like and still supporting mm-hmm. it. It's it's one of those, I mean, I feel like I'm quite indifferent on the topic because when people use it, I'm like, I'm not going to change my opinion on them. I, I'm just not mm-hmm. going to use it myself uh, because I just, I don't want to upset anyone. I want people to feel comfortable, you know, especially as well as a teacher. Uh, I don't know if you feel like this, we have like a bit of a responsibility to make everyone feel comfortable because, you know, mm-hmm. we teach a lot of different people. So I just think if it was to offend even just one person in my class, that's no good for me do you know what I mean Mm -hmm. I'd rather just call it something else if it was going to offend anyone but yeah Yeah. it's a really difficult one I was really sad that she didn't want to come talk about it because I'm sure she had her reasons I'm sure she did you know maybe she needed the money and 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 Mm. you could say well that isn't that a bit of a sellout but actually hard times babe hard times right I mean uh, it really was though but I don't (laughs) know how obviously there might be people will be like yeah but I don't think you should sell out for a price but I I think sometimes when you got bills to pay, right, <laughs> you got to. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's funny because there was a there was someone had written in as well about um, we have someone in the UK that was a like, quite a big advocate for um, people being paid like a good amount of money to perform, and they've set like an industry standard of what they think you know the minimum should be, and they run a show where people get paid really really well, and it's such an amazing movement. And then that same person performed for Snoop Dogg for like. Three hundred dollars, <laughs> and you know, and you think like it goes against everything that you've you've all this good work you've done, and it's just like, and and what for? It kind of discredits what you've said, which is why. Mm-hmm. Do you think that might be a reason why, as well, many people just have discredited the, the whole exotic word situation because they're just like, well, she judged exotic generation, so. I'm just going to start using it again. Do you think that people use that sometimes as an excuse to be like, well, if she's going to use it again, then I'll use it. Do you know what I mean? No, but I think um, the excuse comes from big companies like Exotic Generation having that title and having categories called exotic or people having pole pseudo classes called exotic. I think it comes from that. And then people just follow suit from either doing those competitions or taking those classes. Mm. You know what I mean? It's just like, history repeating itself (laughs) right yeah definitely um and obviously the reason why we don't 
use the word is because of its racist roots and that was one of the things that mm-hmm. was on our list of th- things to talk about is like what it is like and what your experience is like of being a you know famous name within the pole community as a black pole dancer like what's your mm-hmm. experience of it like have you have you ever faced any sort of like racism within the industry oh yeah all the time it's i mean i find now we're a lot more woke these days, but at the same time, racism is still there. It's just hiding underneath, seeping through subconsciously. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I've experienced it through my entire life. And like, it was funny because like when my mother said, you need to work 10 times harder than anyone else out there. I never knew what that meant until I, I think until I started stripping actually and realizing how I wasn't treated the, the way other people were, but also, becoming into my street smarts I learned that back in high school and elementary school all those times when I was trying to be like belong or all those instances where I was like is this wrong they were it was an instant of racist moments that I just put off as me being naive Mm -hmm. or maybe I'm not popular enough I'm like no there was some racist tendencies there that I just didn't see because like I said I was very very kept in a closed box because of my mom just didn't really um she thought there was danger out there I swear to god I didn't do anything as a kid until I started stripping so well I mean she's not I wrong found, uh, I, I guess yeah it's not <laughs> yeah I mean there's a lot I just of danger find, there, uh, hey? yeah yeah and I learned it really quickly and the hard way but at the same time um I still felt like I had to uh, people please people mm. all the time. And that's like one of my biggest issues is that I'm always disregarding myself and always letting people walk over me, whether they are using the N word around me, thinking that it's okay. Having friends come up to me, put their arms around their shoulder. I know black people. And I'm like, yeah, like, fuck. Right. <laughs> so I did so much of that, not speaking up. And like, it bothers me so much now so I appreciate you giving me a platform yeah. <laughs> to just like vent it all out, honestly, because uh, yeah. It's important, I think. And it, you know, and to be honest, like not only is it important to give you a platform, but I just want to learn. So I always want to learn. I just think it's important. And I think, I don't know whether it's different for me because I come from another marginalized community being the queer community. And I feel like I can, and not obviously I can't sympathize, but I can kind of empathize with that othering as something different to what everyone else is. Um, So I don't know whether Mm -hmm. that gives me some form of empathy to be able to want to understand and kind of make sure that everyone is heard because I had never felt it when I was a kid. I was bullied really badly as a kid being gay. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, but I know there were a lot of kids, especially in my school, there was hardly any black kids in my school, but the ones that were, they were bullied, right? And and actually, I'm intrigued to ask you about this because... It's funny because I feel like the US has a really big black community. Canada, not so much, no? Exactly. Right. That's the difference. How big crazy. difference as to why the, yeah. So there's not and I black find, dancers in the clubs? No. So funny, fun, fun fact, fun story, good story. Um, I actually was hired to book Snoop Dogg dancers in 2019. And they were adamant on having POC dancers. And I was like, fuck, man, I can't find any. <laughs> I can't find any. No. And it was really difficult. And especially because they threw it at me last minute. So I couldn't even find like the pole dancers that I wanted because they were already booked. So I was like, okay, oh. well, they got to do auditions for this. Right. Yeah. So and that's when that started. Because like, I feel like in the US, like in the clubs, it seems to be that there's a, especially in LA, like I see, well, I, I can only say from the very few people's stories I see, young pole master, for example, all of his girls, they're all girls of color. I mean, it's funny actually, mm. it, amongst his girls and the girls that he trains, the white girls are the ones that stick out like a sore thumb because it's all these beautiful girls of color, like fucking killing it on the stage. And there's hardly any white girls there. Whereas you're mm-hmm. saying that in, in Canada, it's completely the opposite. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Completely opposite. And they're pretty strict on on we'll call this the black girl quota actually so they only allow a certain amount of black people to dance so if there's already one or two and you wanted to work you can't because they've they've got their quota of black girls um if there is a lot of black girls and a few white girls they'll list the 
the stage rotation in a way where it's like white girl, white girl, black girl, white girl, white girl, black girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's wow. like that spaced out and whatnot. Um, you can't dance to rap music. Rap music is banned in a lot of clubs because, I mean, first of all, shootings happen everywhere and with any kind of music, I think. But um, in the contracts here in Alberta, it really said no rap music. <laughs> what the fuck? So, so and I feel like that, that alone perpetuates the racism, right? Because racism, once again, is taught. Well, this is so, it. and that's what, that's it right there. That's just crazy. So I didn't. It's, I mean, it's just learning, obviously, when you don't live in the US, or you don't live in Canada. You know, just total mm -hmm. ignorance. I just assume, well, they're connected, right? So surely it's going to all the whole country is going to be kind of very similar in terms of. Obviously, there's going to be areas that are more have more POC people than others. But God, I didn't realize that Canada it sounds like Canada is a lot more of a racist country than the US is. Yeah, not the land of the free. It's not so free. Right. With all the bodies that we're finding, too, of all the indigenous people, it's just ridiculous right now. And it just makes it makes Canada Day depressing that's for sure right someone um someone said to me once that uh the pole industry is very much white dominated what's your thoughts on that would you agree with that oh, oh big time and i'm hoping to make a change with that with this competition right so, that's amazing but yeah big time and what's the percent so for like your competition what's the do you, i maybe you don't even know i mean what's the percentage of um like poc dancers teaching to like white dancers that are coming to teach and perform and stuff at the competition. Do you know? Is there, is, uh, is there many POC dancers? I, I, like, no. Not that I know of because I'm not, I'm only judging one online category. So the rest of them are judged by the rest of Because I have nine online judges, so I'm only judging. Oh, which see. category am I judging? Sens sensual category. So I don't know unless I watch all the videos. But, I mean, that's not the goal. I want people to just come to be comfortable and be who they are um, in a safe space. Mm -hmm. um, I think my goal is to have more representation on the panel and on the stage and in the spotlight. So, like, my hosts, my judges, my teachers. Mm -hmm. Nice. I love that you're trying to, like, make the space more welcoming for people of color though, I think it's really important. How would you, mm -hmm. if someone, if someone's like, say for example, I told you, I'm gonna start a competition or an event, what would be your, obviously there's so many, but like what would be your main tips? If someone said, I wanna make it inclusive, I want people of color to feel comfortable to come. Like, how do they do that? Um, Like how would they just produce their own show? Like. You know, just, I feel like... Um, I mean, like, how would they, getting... like, how do we... You know when people, it's funny, because, again, it's a topic that's been discussed, where studios say we're inclusive, but what does it mm -hmm. mean? You know, how right. do you make this event, this fictional event I'm going to start? How gotcha. do I, you know, do I just make sure that I'm employing, you know, people of colour for the event? And, you know, is that... I mean, that's but, obviously one step that I know would help, but is there anything else that you think yeah. that people might not think of that would really help? That's definitely what I find is the problem. I'm not going to mention any studios, but some Toronto studios have um, some clicky behavior tendencies. And right now I've noticed a lot of studios are doing um, after dark showcases where they're charging patrons to come in. And this actually happened during COVID when strip clubs were closed and couldn't work. So pole studios were opening and hosting events and yeah, stripping down to their pasties, serving liquor in their studios without the license for partial nudity or liquor license and getting away with it and not hiring strippers at all. So that was a big thing. So I would like to see, sure, by all means do that, but I would love to see strippers being invited to um, these showcases and paid for what they do, especially when now this is becoming more popular to do than going to the strip club. Why, why do you think and they don't invite them? That's that clicky behavior. It's that inclusivity that they prey on that they don't have. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, wait, you're so inclusive. No, you're not, though. Right. 
Right. You, you may act like you are, but you're not. Because, yeah. I think it's funny as well it. because, you know, it's, I didn't, you know, and this is why I love having chats like this because I'm always learning. Like, you know, when you said, when I was talking about the in inclusivity thing, and I was like, I was just really in that point, I was only thinking about how I could invite more POC people to these events or studios and stuff. And then when you said about, you know, you need to be looking at how you can, you know, run these events and stuff and invite strippers and you think, Oh, yeah god of course like it's not this isn't just a pure this is about you know trans people gay people black people you know strippers like all these people do you know what I mean and I think sometimes many people forget about that and they think that actually inclusivity mm -hmm. isn't just for one marginalized group it's for many of them it's um mm -hmm. it's I feel like there's just this minefield sometimes when you want to run an event or something you think right how can I make this as inclusive as possible so you you hire people of colour, you try and get some people on the panel who are part of the queer community, and but then someone will say to you, why is there no trans representation? Do you not find that sometimes that, that you can only do so much, right? Like, how do you... Yeah. So with that, um, I looked into non-profit organisations. So Strap.to and Maggie's Toronto are, are two... Um, well, Maggie's Toronto is a non-profit organisation, and Strap.to is like the biggest party for queer lgbtq black like and and she creates or they create safe spaces for these parties and i got them a booth at my event just because i wanted that representation there right. and longtime friends so they'll also be speaking on my panel but it's also like i said you got to do that research and just maybe like look into those or uh, organizations that are around you and they can actually point you into the right direction mm -hmm. as to who you can talk to for that. Yeah, oh, I love that. That's really good. Moving mm. on to something slightly different. Sorry to, to change the subject there, but I'm literally just really <laughs> conscious of time. And I feel like I had so many things that I wanted to talk to you about. I wanted to talk to you about um, performer life and like what mm. your goals are kind of like for future. Because obviously performing is your main income. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. And my husband wants a child. I'm like, no! <laughs> I'm, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready! What does he do? I'm ready, but I'm not ready. <laughs> what does he do? Uh, he's a truck driver. Okay. Boring. <laughs> right. oh, okay, fair. Yeah, but they get paid really yeah. good money, though, right? They get paid really good money. And he was the only person working during COVID. Oh, my God. Yeah. Hold on a second. Course. My dog's barking. Hey! I love the way you give the dog the look. You're like, please, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so he's a truck driver. So he's he's doing his... How does he feel about you? you I hope you don't mind me saying this. Gallivanting around yeah. the world, doing all these crazy things. Uh, is he I supportive? Mean, he's like my big time. He's like my biggest fan. And it's the first time that I've ever felt really supported and and... and not vilified for what I do. Like, there's no judgment. He trusts me and he helps me build my props. <laughs> so I love oh, that. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, so he's quite a handy guy. He's a handy guy. That's amazing. <laughs> and does he travel and come and watch you or is he normally working? Yeah, sometimes. He actually, uh, when I won the Miss Nude, Euro bleh, Miss Nude Universe competition, oh. he f drove all the way down to Wisconsin from Winnipeg. When he, where he was working tell me like, yeah. like, what is that in hours <laughs> oh geez like 14 hours wow I think. oh my god yeah. one way yeah well both what directions he drove there and then he left after the, the event was done oh my god Go that is crazy yeah. well that's dedication hey so what's your like yeah. what's your goals and aspirations as a performer like do you have anything that you're reaching for like is there a show that you'd really like to be in or you'd be like to be invited to or yeah i'd love to do pole masters event but looking at all those talented beasts i'm like i think i'll just go watch <laughs> so what's that you mean the pole olympics uh, so no, so Young Pole Masters Playhouse. Oh yes, that is amazing, yeah. isn't it? I keep seeing. Yeah. And it just looks. Let me awesome. just go check on this guy. Yeah, go on, you go. Well, for anyone, uh, One second. I'm just gonna tell anyone who's listening now. If you haven't actually looked it up, go and look up Pole Masters Playhouse. 
uh, Miles, who has been on this podcast before, uh, runs a big show in, I believe it's in LA, um, which is oh, awesome. So yeah, go and check him out. Oh, we're back. We're back. I'm back. <laughs> the dog's happy okay. now. Yes, yeah, somewhat. I don't <laughs> think she's dismissing uh, Mavis. There's two dogs, so she's not in the house right now. So she's like, "Where are you?" I think. Um, I think Miles will have you on the show. You just gotta keep pestering him <laughs> and be like, "Have <laughs> me, damn it!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think he would. I think it just for me, it's like a confidence thing. These people are absolutely amazing on that stage, and for me, it's also stepping into a new world where it's like going to a POC strip club, which I've never been to before, ever, right? It's like watching P Valley in real life. So right. it's, it's intimidating, but I want to be a part of it so bad. Yeah. So I'm actually in the process of um, getting my performer visa so I can come to the US and just work freely without looking over my shoulder. <laughs> right, of course. Yeah, yeah, because I guess obviously yeah. if you go to the US, they're going to be like, why are you here, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just on yeah, holiday. No, no, I'm just just on holiday. <laughs> Do you? I know it sounds stupid, but would it not be a better idea to actually just go with normal clothes and then ask someone to post your heels and stuff? Oh yeah. Would that not be? I mean, that's the that's the smartest thing to do is to like make some friends, ship your costumes over. Right. <laughs> you know. But isn't it yeah. isn't it crazy that? You have to go to such lengths. You'd think it'd make more sense for them to, because this thing, I really want to get a, a visa to go to the US to be able to teach, because I get asked to teach that all the time. But it's so difficult. I just think it'd be so much mm -hmm. better if they just said, right, here's a website. Tell us how much you predict you're going to make. Declare how much you make when you leave. And, and this is the charge you will pay. Done. I feel process. like more people and would actually pay rather than just try and sneak in, right? Because they'd just be like, okay, well, that's yeah. a fairly easy process. So I'm just going to do it and I'll pay yeah. my taxes or whatever you need me to do. And then I can come and yeah. do it. Like, oh, it's just such a ball ache. Like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why they make it so hard, but I wonder if, if everyone knew about it, then they'd have an influx of people in the US working, taking jobs away from US citizens. Right. Like, but I don't understand why it's still not easily accessible like look re reading for information on like a tn visa or a performer visa was like what <laughs> and, yeah. and then reading the lingo is like i don't understand i don't understand what this means <laughs> well i mean just totally randomly but you know um annika russell yes, so yes. she's got a student called i think it's whitney actually that was doing it but she used to work for immigration so she could probably help you because she's actually the one that helps me get my canadian one because she was like, oh, tell him that he doesn't have to apply for this. He can apply for this instead. And we were like, oh, my God, this is like amazing. So we ended up applying for I this other Whitney. thing. I love Whitney. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, get in contact because maybe she'll be able to help you. But, yeah. Well, on it. <laughs> listen, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. I've, I've loved chatting to you. It's been such a breath of fresh air to be able to speak to you. And I loved meeting you when I was in Canada. So I'm so glad that I could get you on <laughs> to my podcast. Yes, yeah, me as well. But, yeah, me thank well. you so much. Wishing you the best of luck with your show. And anyone who is listening, please go and watch it. Um, can you just, before we leave, can you tell everyone where they can find you on socials, how they find out about the competition? Give us, sell us all your stuff. Let's go. Yeah, here's my shameless plug. Yes. You can find me at O N Y X S A C H I on Instagram. You can find the competition at S K R I P P E D D O N W on Instagram. And the website is also www.scriptdown.com. Awesome. Well, like I said, if you can get to Toronto or you live in Toronto, please go and watch the show, support it and support the amazing performers that are going to be performing, teaching, take the workshops, send money to Onyx for being amazing. Just do all of those things. Yeah, send please. me money. Yeah, send me money. <laughs> um, thank you so much for uh, coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. I hope thank to you for having soon. me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode. We really hope you enjoyed it. Wasn't she the loveliest person ever? If you are in Toronto or you can get to Toronto to go and see the show, please do go and watch Script Down because it's going to be an awesome show and it will be so nice if you went and supported the event. Until next time, bye. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next time.